Dr. Campbell is a Southwestern archaeologist and especially focused on Diné historical archaeology. But he's also worked in many other areas in Africa, Latin America, and the Southeast US. He's had many awards and grants. And the only one I want to mention is, of course, Arkin Hiss's very own Julian D. Hayden Prize, which he won uh, a year ago. So uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Campbell, and we're looking forward to what he has to say. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Fran. Very much appreciate the, the introduction. Yeah, hey, everybody. Um, um, as Paul said, I am a newly minted assistant professor in the Anthro Department and Archaeology Program at Boston University, and I'm pleased to come to you tonight. It is quite dark. It is 10 p.m. here on the ancestral homelands of the Massachusetts and Nipah people, otherwise known as Boston, Massachusetts. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about some of my dissertation research, um, as well as some of the ways I'm looking to take it uh, forward in the future in a talk entitled Exploring the Rise of Navajo Pastoralism in the Pericolonial Southwest. Um, there's some funky parentheses in the title, and I'll hopefully try to uh, dive into that to some extent. Um, and I have to say, you know, this has been what, two years, two and a half years of like Zoom talks and things. And I have to confess, I have never done a Zoom, like official Zoom webinar in sweatpants before, but given that it's 10 PM and I wanted to feel kind of cozy, I did it. And I got to say, it's, it's it's pretty nice. So it's put me in the right frame of mind. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get us started. Because if you've seen me talk before, met me in person, you know I tend to be a little long-winded. So I need all the time I can get. Um, all right, here we go. OK, so uh, let me make this a little smaller so I don't see myself talking. And OK, one of the rise of Navajo pastoralism in the US Southwest. Okay, so um, I figure uh, this is a useful intro for folks, but basically what I'm going to run through is just an introduction to the topic. Um, what is the net pastoralism? What is the net sheep herding? Why, why should you care? Um, why, you know, might you uh, otherwise be interested or not? Um, an overview of the research itself and then some findings, musing, takeaways, and then we can hopefully get to the question and answer. Um, I included a map in, in the, the oh so slight possibility that you have logged on to the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society's lecture series at 7 p.m. and don't know where the Navajo Nation is. Um, so, but you know, you might not know where some of these areas that I'm talking about are. So uh, over the course of the talk, these three sort of circles, ellipses, uh, will delineate some of the areas that I'll be referring to. When I talk about Spanish colonial New Mexico or Nuevo Mexico, I'm referring to the Rio Grande River Valley, um, the land of the Pueblos, modern day Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Española, Taos, etc. Talking about Black Mesa, I'm talking about Zithagene, the larger sort of landform that anchors the western part of the Navajo Nation um, that has been the site of a lot of sort of interesting political back and forth over the past century due in large part to coal mining um, and this sort of shared status that it has that is home to both a large Navajo community as well as the scattered handful of Hopi villages at its southern edge. Um, uh, and then the third and final sort of ellipsis is Denetra, literally meaning among the Dene, among the Navajo. This is a term that nowadays gets often gets referred to sort of the larger Navajo nation or sort of everywhere that Navajo people are. But um, arguably in its sort of uh, more, well, in its more archeological form, it's talking about this area, this sort of the traditional Navajo heartland, which is also reflected in traditional Navajo teachings as, as the place from which Navajo people emerge and, and, and come to be. And it's here in this kind of the Largo Gobernador drainage, the upper, Rio, uh, the upper San Juan region on the New Mexico Colorado border, east of Farmington, New Mexico, sort of south of Durango. Um, all right, so with that in mind, everything's set. Let's go forward. All right, so Navajo sheep, sheep herding. Why am I talking about this? Um, and I guess first things first is that sheep and sheep herding are a really integral part of Navajo culture um, and, and history. Um, 
it's intimately connected with a lot of those material markers that people think of when they think of Navajo people in the Southwest today, whether it's rugs uh, and, and rug weaving, you know, this sort of quintessential Navajo art form, right, which nowadays garners big bucks on Antiques Roadshow and leaves everybody in the Southwest hoping that the thing on their wall or on their couch is, you know, half a million or a million dollars. Um, but then also too, you know, you see it, uh, if you drive through the res, you'll see, you know, references to, to uh, mutton and cuisine and, and sort of the central role that sheep play in, in traditional Diné food ways. Um, this is from, a, I, I took this screenshot from a, a YouTube video where it's, uh, some white folks go through the res and try a bunch of, of foods at the Gallup flea market, which I thought was really funny. If you want to take a look at it, you can go search that, that link there. Um, you know, but the fascinating part about this is right is even though uh, Navajo sheep herding is is held is pretty central um, to sort of the historic economy, the historic identity of Navajo people, um, and arguably remains a central part of Navajo identity today, as these memes and, and um, some of them are guests, but they're not running um, as these memes and such show. You know. Uh, Sheep and sheep herding, the, the, the role of sheep in Navajo culture remains this kind of cultural touchstone, this kind of marker of cultural authenticity within contemporary Diné society. You know, even the, the Miss Navajo Nation pageant, um, which in recent years has done away with some of the older competitions that were held to, to uh, reflect the influence of colonial foodways and colonialism, like the fry bread making competition, you know, that was jettisoned but the sheep butchering competition was kept because it, it was held to be one of these um, quintessential tests of, of, uh, of a Navajo woman's traditional knowledge. Uh, you know, and I think this is really interesting because if you take a step back and look at this, well, the, the traditional argument for um, sort of the entry of Western domesticates into the US is that they arrive with Europeans and, um, the introduction of Western domesticates like sheep, goat, horses, cattle, etc., cetera, um, is, can be tied to this moment. And when you start to look at this, then the role of, of sheep in Navajo culture is this interesting phenomena in which an introduced uh, animal species essentially becomes central to the identity of the people that have been in the Southwest for time immemorial. The interesting thing, you know, well, I won't say an interesting, but I, I think it is. I, the interesting thing about this is that when people have gone to study this, they've ended up focusing basically on the period from the 1860s onward, from the period of, of Navajo Wars and the internment at Fort Sumner um, into the 20th century. Uh, Martha Weisiger's book about you know, dreaming about sheep in Navajo country is probably the most recent and, and best synopsis of this. Um, and it, it's a fascinating phenomenon, right? You have this incredible growth after the Fort Sumner internment um, and the return to the Four Corners, the establishment of the reservation and the, the skyrocketing sheep population, the kind of reclamation of this pastoral tradition. And that's brought to a halt in the 30s uh, through environmental change and these livestock reduction policies put in place by the US government such that by the 2017, uh, by you know, according to the 2017 USDA agricultural census, there's you know less than 200,000 sheep on the reservation today. You know, so this is a huge sort of rise and decline. And I find it really interesting because everything focuses on this latter period. But if you want to sort of contextualize this, this this sort of rise and fall within the larger sort of historical tradition of Navajo sheep herding, you're, you're left kind of grasping at straws slightly because this question of, well, how does it go from initial introduction of, of these domesticates um, to this high point? How are these animals received, adopted, manipulated, embraced to the point that by, uh, you know, 1800, the Spanish governor of New Mexico is noting that Navajos don't want for sheep because their own herds are innumerable. That sounds like something almost similar in scale and scope to what we know from the turn of the 20th century, but the documentation, the evidence for it has been lacking. And so when you look at these recent historical studies, 
they've been unable to to engage with this earlier period. And the, the, the fascinating question is kind of why? And you think that this would be something archaeology would be well suited to answer, and you'd be right. Now the question is why haven't people done this in the past? And so this is one of the things that I got really interested in and wanted to investigate further. Um, in particular, as I delved into this earlier period, one of the things that stood out to me was that the story of the Neb pastoralism is one that I think is kind of unique in, in, in many ways in the Southwest. Um, pastoralism hurting in and of itself isn't, isn't uh, necessarily totally novel. Um, the Pueblos developed pastoral traditions, but I think it's, it's interesting because those traditions have two kind of factors uh, behind them. One, they're occurring within the dynamic of Spanish colonial control within uh, Spanish New Mexico, this sort of missionized semi-feudal system. But also, as we've seen recently, there has been some great talks um, given, I think a couple were done through, I think it's through the Arc Southwest series, right, about sort of the role in which people are realizing that Turkey husbandry is approaching some sort of low-grade pastoralism in, in the Southwest among Anasazi people. And you know, the public communities are tied into that. Among the Navajo, there doesn't seem to be that same sort of arc. Um, there are clans that seemingly have these relations, but there isn't sort of this large sort of tradition, it seems, of, of say a turkey herding. And so if you step back and look at the, the, the sort of lack of this historical tradition, the lack of this imposed Spanish colonial framework, you see something remarkable in that Navajo people are embracing a, a introduced foreign technology, in this case, you know, the animal and the knowledge uh, about how to, to um, benefit from it, how to care for it, and how to set up these relationships that will support each other. Um, in a way that is, is really remarkable, such that right by, by the 19th century, Navajo folks are, are the pastoralist par excellence of, of the Southwest. And this, this phenomenon is mirrored on the plains, um, you know, where the introduction of the horse transforms a world of farmers, hunter-gatherers into these equestrian societies that, you know, um, really come to, come to rule the, the area. Um, I think the reason why this has received um, potentially less attention is in part that it's horses are much sexier than uh, sheep. And in some ways it has obscured the, the ability to look at those same transformations that are taking place among Navajo people, among the net communities in the, seven, in the 16 and 17 hundreds. And so with that realization, this became my, my big interest, right? What is this early period like? And what is hurting in this early period, like especially given that the mechanisms of Spanish control were not extended past the boundaries of the Rio Grande River Valley to um, Navajo communities, effectively. And as I said, you know, why hasn't archaeology dealt with this? It seems like, like a, a big thing. And I think part of it owes and sort of to the historical state of Navajo archaeology in the Southwest, which um, is kind of one of the many, I would argue, sort of red-haired stepchildren of, of Southwestern archaeology. I, I, I pulled these maps just to sort of demonstrate a point. I'm not trying to say anything about sort of the research, but I do think it's very interesting that if you look at these maps, there's a, a couple big glaring holes that are kind of reservation sized. And there's essentially, you know, there, Navajo people have been involved in archaeology since Richard Wetherill hired Navajo laborers to help him dig up Chaco and to help you know, guide him and his brothers to these sites throughout the Southwest. Um, there have been, you know, the earliest uh, CRM projects were arguably the El Paso gas lines that went across the Southern part of the res in the fifties. Um, and so, you know, the, the Navajo world, Navajo community has been intimately tied to the practice of archaeology in the Southwest for a long time. But in terms of actually being the focus of, of archaeological questions, there actually hasn't been that much engagement. I find this a really kind of fascinating issue um, in terms of both Navajo archaeology as, as, as a subject of research, but archaeology on the reservation itself. 
um, in a way that kind of engages with the Navajo community. And I'm really curious about this. Maybe we can talk about it in Q&A, but I think it's worth pointing this out because there hasn't been a lot of research. And what research that has occurred has predominantly focused off the reservation in the area known as the Netta. But even in that case, most of the research has focused on what you see here down on the lower left, these, these pueblitos, these uh, Navajo fortresses uh, that were built to protect from, from um, Spanish Utes and other raiders in the Dineta area during essentially the first half of the 18th century. And as a result, basically, you know, up until really the, the late 80s and early 90s when the Fruitland oil and gas project took off and, and started making people do these larger surveys that put them into con conversation with these sites that were you know, the daily, the sites of daily life and activity, did people start to engage with non pueblito sites to a, to a greater and more critical degree? And I think it's sort of telling that even today, um, you know, we don't know a lot about kind of everyday Navajo life in these earlier periods in part because I think it's kind of hard. It's, you know, um, learning how to recognize a collapsed Hogan, learning how to recognize a burnt Hogan, learning how to recognize non-painted pottery that's incredibly friable. Um, it, it, it challenges uh, the archaeologists to sort of expand their horizon, expand their expectations um, so that they can come to grips with these things. And also, um, unlike sort of sites with a lot of deposition, a lot of these are, are short-lived, short occupation sites that don't have a lot of deposition and stratigraphy, meaning that when it comes to traditional zoo archaeological approaches to pastoralism, you know, looking at animal bones, quantifying them, typing them, and being like, oh, there's a sheep here, there's a goat here, and there's a bunch of deer here, we're not able to do that very well because either the bones are incredibly weathered and fragmented, they're not deposited on the site, or the sites are being located through survey work, often in a CRM context, and, and the majority of them aren't being excavated. And so you have all these questions essentially about where do sheep and sheep herding fall within the context of Navajo archaeology. And so with in in this kind of haze, I guess, I, I, I didn't know what to do. But I I um, you know, as as Paul was sketching out at the, the beginning, you know, I, I I had some experience working in other parts of the world, and I was always really curious about cultures who, with archeological traditions that, um, that investigate, sorry, with archeological traditions that investigate cultures that are similar to Navajo, uh, in, in, at least to, to my eyes. So I got very interested in work in Central Asia, um, work in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the ways in which people investigate a range of questions, human landscape interaction, you know, the, the role of climate, um, uh, and its impacts on past societies, but also the role of pastoralism and the way that people are looking at, at human animal relationships and realizing that they weren't often, <laughs> the zoo archeology span is only one part of it. There are these other ways to look at it and it can generally be glossed as a pastoral landscape approach. This idea that you look at herding as a, as a larger system involving humans, animals, and the environment. And in this tripartite system, there are certain types of infrastructure built in natural features that help to structure a pastoralist's activities on the landscape. Um, and these include, you know, habitations, right? The places where you, the human lives, um, corrals, the places where animals live or are penned or kept. Um, also things like fields um, and reservoirs and paths and cairns and salt licks, you know, all these sorts of things um, are in the mind of, of, of herders when they're out on their day-to-day -day activities. And I realized that if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to, I, I could take this approach. And in particular, if you look here at this part of the screen, I think you can see, but nope, back. If you see here, you see this sort of discoloration, you see those little like rice grains, right? Those are sheep uh, against a backdrop of uh, manure and rich soil. And I realized that corrals in particular are key areas of pastoral infrastructure because not only are they centers of 
daily herding activities, economic herding activities like shearing and, and lambing and milking and things like that. But the, they're also, they can become distinct features on the landscape thanks to the buildup of dung and, and urine and such that enrich and chemically alter the soil such that you can see the, the, the signatures of this um, at a macro level for a while actually and at a microscopic level for even longer, both in terms of soil chemistry and then also micro remains in the soil itself. And so I decided I would take an approach that would focus on that. That is grandiosely titled perhaps the early Navajo pastoral landscape project, right? At its core, how is, is this question of how can I look at this question of early Navajo herding? Um, how do I identify, how do I identify pastoral sites more confidently? And if I can, how can I identify um, those features at those sites that will allow me to say that they're there and then start to tease out these other social and economic relationships that, that interest me as an archaeologist relating to the question of incipient pastoralism um, by, by an indigenous community. Um, and so the, the project as a whole, the methodology, right, this sort of pastoral landscape approach is this kind of uh, descending uh, series of, of activities designed to kind of hone in on potential corral areas. And at, at the core is ethnoarchaeology and then geospatial modeling to help narrow the, the sample down. And then at a site level, then survey, soil sampling, other analyses uh, and like soil chemistry work and soil microremains work. And so now for this last, for this next part, what I want to talk about is some of the results from the different phases of the recent field work that I did, um, both on the reservation itself and then for authores in the NETA, um, designed to get at these questions here. And, okay, and of course, okay. So the first phase, right, was this ethnoarchaeological phase, this learning from herding, right? I've always been interested in this, but I grew up in the 90s at a time when um, herding was becoming less common. And as the youngest one of my generation, I, my, my older siblings, and so they, they had the chance to go and work, uh, well, chance, they were, they were sent in the summer to go live with my grandparents and to, to help with these activities. And they experienced it in a way that I hadn't. And I decided that if I was gonna to try to do this and, and have this pastoral landscape approach, I better understand to a, a much better degree what it means to herd sheep. Um, and so I went and apprenticed with my aunt for, for six months uh, at, our, at my family's you know, traditional home site area up on uh, Black Mesa. And so for six months, I took part in the daily herding activities at this ranch, essentially, to about 250 sheep and goats, some cattle, daily herding in and out. Um, and along the way, I took note of a bunch of things. I, as you can see on the right, I, I put GPS collars or GPS collars on a, a pair of animals every day to see where they went. And that resulted in what you're gonna see here on the left. And then I also went out and in the course of her and I made notes as to the types of archeological sites, the historical um, sites that I saw on the landscape related to herding. And so what you see on the right here is a Navajo summer camp that was used by my family um, during the 1950s and into the 60s. And you can see quite clearly at the bottom, there's a habitation, a, a hogan, um, a activity area, this sort of shade house, and then a corral built up against this rock wall. And I realized basically that um, I could use this information to help me understand some of the logics behind which my family uh, structured their herding activities throughout the late 19th and 20th centuries and into the present day. And so I had a wealth of geospatial data in terms of kind of the, the herding activities that we were doing uh, in 2018, as well as this archeological site data. Um, you know, I recorded the, I, I mapped these sites out, recorded the features, I took tree ring dates where I could, and I used all that information um, to help generate a geospatial model for Navajo herding, or for pastoral site suitability. And then I generalized those results and applied them to the study area that I was interested in, in the NETA. So using 
20th, 21st century uh, archaeological Navajo pastoral site information to help set a baseline to test for older Navajo herding strategies. Um, and so if you've never been to the Neta, this is what the landscape is. This is Gomorador Canyon. Um, and as you can see here, there's a lot of oil and gas work. Um, you know, the, the, the issues that are affecting the greater Chaco landscape uh, first happened here. Um, but this was all BLM land that, that was developed. And it is arguably one of the most sacred places in Navajo culture. Um, Gobernador Knob is just off the screen to the left. You know, there, there are all sorts of sites here that um, have a lot of importance to, to the, the net community. And it's absolutely pockmarked with oil and gas wells. Um, the one upside of this was that, you know, as I said earlier, the, the, the CRM work that was associated with this um, enabled a, a better understanding of the Navajo archaeological record such that we can have these sorts of conversations that we're having now. And part of that was the identification of, you know, hundreds of sites across the Largo Gogondor area, San Juan Largo Gogondor area. Um, they're cataloging um, and, you know, some initial work done. And so uh, what I wanted to do was hone in on a particular area that had been previously surveyed as part of the Fruitland project and revisit sites and retest them um, to see if I could identify potential pastoral features, i.e. corrals. Um, and so I had a subset of samples from these studies that the prior researchers had noted might be um, pastoral sites as well. And then, and then, so that was like four sites or so. And then I bulked out the sample using, um, using the, the, the pastoral site suitability, the, the geospatial model to help kind of uh, broaden the sample size and try to choose some other areas that, you know, might not necessarily have been picked. And so um, one of them actually was more site one, one of the sort of famous Navajo pueblitos. Um, and another Pueblito, uh, and you'll notice that essentially both clusters of sites that I sampled, the majority of them were actually located in these kind of little neighborhoods around a, a, a pair of Pueblitos. Um, okay, so what ensued, and I'm gonna use this site as an example for the work that I did at, at all 12 of them, but essentially, you know, I would go to these sites, relocate them, which was an adventure in and of itself, and re-identify structures and features on the surface that were previously identified, um, as well as any new features, and map them. Uh, if there were any faunal remains on the surface that were intact and potentially um, able to be speciated, I drew them and took measurements in the field and left them in the field. And also took uh, tree ring samples from culturally modified tree features around the site in an effort to provide a potential datable material for the activities there. Next, I laid out a systematic 15 meter grid and collected soil samples, little soil cores um, from these little footstep probes. And, you know, there's not a lot of soil deposition here. So I was able to get pretty good samples um, from all of these and sent these samples off to be analyzed um, at an environmental um, science lab in Farmington the samples were examined for their phosphorus content to reflect you know, potential organic material. Um, and there, there's a range of things that can elevate um, phosphorus content, including um, you know, general organic debris, um, but also you know, dung, right? It's why we manure fields. Um, and so with that soil chemistry information, I, you know, put it in and interpolated sort of phosphorus surfaces for each of the sites. And then I went and compared the, um, the site feature information against these, these phosphorus scapes, trying to see if they were high phosphorus areas that matched up with um, structures or features that may have potentially been misidentified as um, well, non non corrals, and the interesting is that there's there's um, there, there's cause for this basically, and uh, in, in some of the fruitland work actually, um, 
there's a great example from on top of Francis Mesa, which is the same landform, but basically uh, the folks from La Plata Archaeological Services had surveyed Francis Mesa and then a few years later won the contract to excavate a couple of sites that were going to be impacted by a road. And they found that when they excavated the site that they surveyed, the same crew, um, a couple of the things that on the surface seemed to be similar to Hogan's or other scatters, and that's what they had been identified as, actually had subsurface soil characteristics that suggested um, that they were actually um, buried animal pens or things like that. And so then this raises the, you know, okay, so if, if, if certain features are potentially being misidentified, you know, say a shade house or a corral or something is being called a Hogan, we should re, you know, reorient our attention towards these areas and, and test them to see if those identifications are correct. And so that's what happened here. So you can see that this sample, these samples, these high phosphorus samples were selected for secondary testing. Um, and I sent them off to have them analyze for fecal spherulite, um, fecal spherulite presence, right? These, these are things that form the digestive tract of, of ruminants like sheep and goats um, who produce the most. And they're little calcium, calcium oxalate concretions that form in the gut. And they're really kind of long lived or sort of similar in some ways to um, like phytoliths. And building this up then, there seems to be a, a, a a collection of various points of evidence that suggest that this feature, which was described as a hogan initially, might be better understood as a collection of sort of rocks and a stump that actually may have been part of like the, the base of a, of a corral feature. Um, and at two other sites, actually, there's something similar. Um, against the Morris One Pueblito, against the edge, you have a, a an area where there's um, a slight overhang. And then at LA78825, which is the largest Hogan site on Francis Mesa, you have a really interesting um, scatter of branches that are kind of tied into these living trees um, that, again, have fecal spherulites. They are potentially kind of features that have been misinterpreted and have elevated phosphorus content that all in all, I would argue suggest that they are better understood as, as pen features um, that we can then investigate further. And so again, this is just the three sites you know, together, um, but right, it's worth pointing out that here you can see in this, um, you know, a classic collapsed Hogan, like at this site here has a, has a nice like radial alignment this site does not, and it's uh, or this feature does not, and it's scattered over a much larger area. has a bunch of cut and sort of broken branches that are scattered throughout the trees here, um, and so you, you can see this this delineation um, between uh, structure, sort of habitation structures, and then sort of alternative structures, then special use structures. And the question is, might these be corrals? And I think if you go through this process, then you can make the argument that. Uh, yes, it is quite likely. And so with that in mind, then you can start to ask some of these broader questions then about sort of social economic um, connections between uh, communities within um, the, the sort of early Navajo population in the Neta in the 16 and 1700s. Um, and so one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, all these sites date to the first half of the century. They're, they're basically pre-1750, from between 1700 and 1750. They're in association or, or um, they're often arranged around these pueblitos and they seem to be clustered in really interesting ways. And so this map builds upon the work that was done by uh, um, Richard Wills Houston, um, Tim Hobazak, and Leslie Sessler, as well as the, the NAD archaeology crews led by Doug Dykeman, in which they were starting to play with these ideas of, you know, how, what is the early Navajo settlement landscape like for the 16 and 1700s in Dineta, and how might they be organized? And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that I would argue that these clusters present a really interesting opportunity to harness traditional Navajo understandings of relationship and relationality and family, this idea of that links different Navajo groups together by clan, 
by uh, marriage, by family ties, um, into these sort of larger uh, operating structures that, you know, sort of, um, you have the family, the extended family, and then these kind of outfits, um, which has been a subject of you know, a lot of debate in the Navajo anthropological literature over the years. But I think, you know, you do see good evidence for these groups sort of working in concert to construct the pueblitos. And I think by being able to argue for the presence of pastoral sites on the landscape at the same time, we can start to put pastoralism and the role of pastoralism within these early communities into the discussion in a really interesting way. You know, what does it mean that Francis Canyon Pueblito up here is, you know, has a three-story tower and 40 rooms um, and seems to be the anchor of this kind of community here has Myolica, has really kind of a fascinating array of stuff and is contemporaneous with this whole group here. Um, expanding this out then will enable us to, to get a handle on it. And I think asking questions about the role of pastoralism in, in the early Navajo communities when you know the 16, 1700s, you know, one of the things that's really interesting, you know, this this graphic on the left I, I drew from um, sort of the larger discussion of my first phase of work, the ethnoarchaeology work. And if you're curious about this, I can answer questions or um, this was the subject of the, the Kiva article that I uh, put together um, for, for last fall's special issue. Um, but one of the things that stands out here is that um, some of the, some of the, the, the potential pastoral features that I identified two of them are, are more easily bounded and you can kind of get a sense of the area. People have put for various metrics as to how many sheep can be in a potential area. And so one of the interesting things that comes out is that, well, herd sizes aren't large if this is the case, right? If it's a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-one ratio, we're either seeing between 12 to 80 sheep or six to 40 sheep, right? Within so this, this cluster of of, of or within this kind of relatively small sample. The thing that's interesting is that this creates a lot of food for thought in the ways in which herding activities might be occurring on the landscape at that time. And one of the interesting features is that, you know, the analog for early Navajo herding, surprise, surprise, isn't this high point of, of, of the Navajo herding tradition, right? The, the early 1900s when people had hundreds, if not thousands of, of livestock, you know, per, per family. But it's actually more similar in some ways in terms of herd size. Um, and I said, you know, contemporary herd sizes are, are um, nowadays on the Navajo Nation quite, quite small. Um, 50 animals is, is, is held to be large and 250 is, is, is rare. Um, and so, smaller herd sizes, like sort of smaller managed family herd sizes suggest that maybe uh, we can use the, the, the more recent, actually contemporary Navajo herding strategies as a way to understand how people may have been herding in the six, or in the 16, 1700s. Um, and that, okay. And so uh, wrapping up here, I guess, this question of putting all of this in, in putting all this together and looking at the ways in which pastoralism might be playing a role in, in this period, in the Navajo communities of this period, gets back to this other, you know, the, the, the earlier sort of theoretical framing um, for a lot of my questions, this interest in kind of peri-colonialism, right? This idea that groups that were not colonized during the colonial period experienced changes um, in concert with colonized groups that allowed them to maintain a degree of independence that, um, and um, to remain free from, from Spanish colonial rule in, in the case of the Southwest. And I think this is a, really what you see here, right? Where you see um, Navajo folks in Dineta being able to sort of remain outside the scope of Spanish control and along the Rio Grande in part because not only are they kind of remote, but they're also rural, or not rural, sorry, uh, mobile. They're able to, to move when, when times get tough. Uh, and I think they're already mobile, but they become 
increasingly more mobile with the adoption of a, of a pastoral um, life way that enables groups to, to move around more. And, you know, so that's when you see the, the proliferation of Navajo groups out of Dineta and, and into the rest of the Four Corners region over the, you know, 16, 17, 1800s. You know, there's already, the, this map's interesting in, in many ways. We can talk about this too, if people have questions, right? But this is from the New Mexico Cultural Resource Information Service um, from ARMS. And uh, so it's just the New Mexico data, but this is all of the, um, this is all of the uh, the sort of data that they had for Navajo sites in in the in 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 the state at the time, and you can see though that you know you get this spread of uh, people out of Dineta ostensibly and into the rest of these areas. And the question is, what role is herding playing um, at the time? And if we go back to here, these are the sort of earlier pre-1750 Navajo sites. And you can see there are clusters here in the Mount Taylor area. Um, the southern edge is here. We know there's Navajo folks in the Chinle, uh, Cane de Shea area and along the western edge of the Defiance Plateau. You know, what are the relationships that link these communities together such that, you know, they display the same kind of quintessential material culture traits associated with Navajo groups? Um, you know, they're tied to the oral histories of those regions. Uh, how can we start to look at that? And I think with this ability to potentially identify markers for pastoral activity, we can start to evaluate the role to which um, the increasing mobility offered by pastoralism is, is heightening this interconnectivity, this spread, this, this growth um, throughout the Four Corners. And I think then also I put these other two periods here because it's really interesting then to look and consider this in the framework then of, well, what stops it? And what stops it is the arrival of the United States and the imposition of a true colonial system that persists to this day, um, which is enabled by a scorched earth campaign that intentionally targets the Navajo economy um, that breaks down the ability to farm and to herd and then um, you know reduces them into this in prison and then sends them back into an area that is bounded. People start to push out against it though right so the reservation gets bigger and bigger and bigger to accommodate people going back to their original home areas uh, again enabled by increasing herds um, and that process is stopped uh, with the livestock reduction era. And then sort of the more insidious uh, colonial process in which you know, the Navajo community is folded into the larger sort of Western system of like wage work and such kind of starts to take over. And then you see the, the, the diminution of the tradition and to the point that we are today. And so, um, when you think about pericolonialism peri and the ability to remain free, I think one of the things that it highlights is that this, this technology, this new technology, this pastoral technology essentially allows Navajo people to be mobile in a way that they, that amplifies what they had been doing before. And it's only with the sort of breaking down of that mobility then do you see um, what had never occurred during the Spanish period, which is the incorporation of the Navajo community into this colonial system, in this case, the American one. All right, we're at the end, I promise. But basically, all in all, I would argue that some of this, uh, or all of this, is, I would argue, an example of, of, of indigenous archaeology in action and kind of what happens when you can try to do archaeology that is conducted with, for, and by Native peoples. Um, and I would, you know, the, it's it's a definition that you know this with, for, and by is, is arguably the most common definition, common definition of indigenous archaeology today. But arguably, it's a little vague. And I think if you try to break it down, this is what you get, right? The with, for, and by is a focus on indigenous folks conducting research themselves or being engaged in the research process at all points. But I think the argument, right, is and the good reminder is that you don't need to be indigenous to do indigenous archaeology. You can be non-native and 
invest in collaborating with native peoples to generate research that is with, for, and by native people. Um, again, also wrapped up in the idea of an indigenous archeology span is an indigenous methodology that is an, an archeological approach that is in constant dialogue with tribally specific histories, beliefs, and interests and respects those enough to check egos and methods to, and, and to develop creative, innovative responses to certain requests and demands. Like, oh, you know, I can't excavate. How else can I go about um, addressing the questions that interest me? And the last bit is this sort of decolonizing bit, right? But basically the idea is that, you know, by doing this work, and I think as I'm, I'm hoping this talk has kind of shown, by taking a different tack towards a question that has sort of eluded uh, folks for a while, we're, we're starting to be able to generate data that allows us to focus in on aspects of, of Navajo historical experience in the Southwest that, that pushes back against certain areas of, of the traditional narrative, but also generates new data that fleshes out what we do know about those, those periods. Um, and expanded out, you know, these in indigenous archaeological projects allow communities to be active uh, writers of their own history for, for, if not the first time, you know, um, to a larger degree. And you, and you get this really powerful connection between, you know, present and past uh, Native communities. And I think um, I'll plug the other papers that were in the uh, edited volume. Um, from uh, the Kiva issue from the fall, you know, talking about Navajo uranium mining and its archaeological legacy, um, the, using traditional archaeological methods to study crafting, to look at Navajo weaving, and doing, you know, really in-depth ethno history work. All of these are highlighting new aspects of um, archaeological knowledge, historical knowledge um, that we didn't know before. And so uh, with that, I'll wrap it up and I will see a clock for the first time in however long this has been and hopefully we'll have gone too, too over. Um, so yeah, okay, takeaways, right? I think a pastoral landscape approach is well suited to the challenges that face Navajo archeology span with regards to this question. Um, pastoral relationships are these F relationships in which people, animals, environment are all intertwined. I think mobility is the central theme to understand the Diné experience of colonialism over the past 400 years. And I would argue that this project is an example of the value of an indigenous archeological approach um, or trying to put an indigenous archeological approach into practice. So with that, uh, yeah, thank you um, to all my family, friends, and, and all of you kind people who have sat through and listened to me talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Wade. Um, that was super interesting. And I like the connection to really helping us think about the future of archaeology and, and including by, for, and about uh, indigen indigenous people. So I really, really appreciate that. I do have a couple of questions already. So let's just get started. Um, what determines the herd size today? Is it solely family decision or is there Navajo Nation or BIA regulations on that? There are. Well, both. There are grazing restrictions and and um, uh, herd size limits for for um, permit holders. Uh, the numbers vary to some degree um, with different parts of the reservation having potentially different values attached to them. Mm -hmm. um, but you know there are these uh they're quantified in terms of animal units expressed as sheep units generally so you can have if the limit is say 20 animals 20 20 unit 20 animal units you can have 20 sheep or goats or you can have say uh four horses or four cattle and you know what is that i have to do math now <laughs> uh six cows and you know a couple extra sheep no not six cows no yeah like uh six uh, right so there are these <laughs> there are these metrics and these uh, these equivalencies that uh, that that are extensively the amount that is allowed um but the the reality is that also animals need a lot of care 
Um, they need attention. And so it, it's a combination of these factors in which, you know, as families increasingly engage with wage work or, or other demands, you know, pulled into Phoenix or Albuquerque, they're not always, um, you know, in their traditional home areas. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's wrestling, <laughs> there's cattle wrestling and animal wrestling on, on the res. But, you know, um, I have a, a deep appreciation for the amount of, of, of time and effort and energy that goes into to keeping um, a herd, a herd, of, a herd of anything. And so a lot of families, if they're trying to do this, will often only have a handful of animals. They might be doing it for 4-H, or maybe they're a family of weavers and need wool, but they only, you can get enough for your own purposes off of a handful of sheep. Or you might be, holding them in common for multiple families that contribute. So there are a, a range of factors that uh, come into play. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of um, how cattle fit into that? Like how, uh, what percentage or any of that? So cattle are definitely a part of the equation that, um, uh, cattle are definitely a part of the equation that kind of I don't deal with them too much because in some ways the traditional Navajo approach towards managing cattle is not to really manage them much at all. You mm -hmm. kind of, you, you can let them tend for themselves. They're also larger and they can take care of themselves in a way, both horse, horses as well, um, in a way that like sheep and goats kind of can't. Um, and so families will, will tend to manage the sheep and goats more and maybe own some cattle that you know twice a year they'll bring in for branding and vaccinations and uh, tallying for sales and such but otherwise might engage with to a much lesser degree providing salt blocks and breaking up water and occasionally checking on them but not not to the same sort of daily um, interaction okay um <clears throat> you mentioned uh, not being able to excavate. Can you give a couple of other examples of methods you could not apply and those that you, as an indigenous archaeologist, found particularly valuable? So what else could you do? Um, yeah, I mean, so in terms of like my own personal research, um, I think, you know, the, the excavation is the biggest method that I chose not to apply. Other things, I think, you know, say like geophys, it just wasn't, I, I think it'd be really interesting. Um, nobody to my knowledge, or I've never heard of anybody trying to take mag or GPR type stuff to Navajo sites. Um, you know, that was sort of beyond the scope of, of the work that I did. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I have no personal interest in doing bio art kind of stuff. I think I, I, I can live with not being able to <laughs> address some of those questions using some of those methods. Um, and that, that's fine with me. But like I said, I think the, the interesting part about like an indigenous archeological approach is that, well, if you wanna get at those, what other ways could you take to get at that answer? Could you, you know, find some proxy? Could you look at an, another, uh, you know, material culture type that lets you get at the same question, but isn't human remains or isn't necessarily going to bring you into contact with those or increasing possibility, right? And, you know, and as, as, as people know, you know, like I did, I took soil samples because it was the most minimally invasive approach I could think of that would let me get at the question I wanted. Um, in particular, like trying to identify these these features on the landscape involved needed some sort of subsurface component. So this was kind of that that middle ground. Um, you're starting to see people do. I think I think archaeological science techniques in general have a lot to offer to these questions. Um, and you're also starting to see like a lot of drone work. Um, uh, Dr. Woody Aguilar's work um, at San Aldefonso at, at, at Tunio, I think, is a great example of a research project that is survey based. Uh, drone-based investigations of sort of this complex battlefield site, right? Um, those those sort of come to, to the top of my mind. Um, so yeah. Great, great. Um, 
Uh, so this one says, thanks for the wonderful lecture, Wade. I'm in looking at your phosphorus maps. What are you thinking about human versus animal input of phosphorus into the soil? I think it's definitely, so the human, so I guess, right, am I mischaracterizing certain areas uh, that might be like human input, right? So phosphorus, people have been investigating phosphorus content at archaeological sites since, I, uh, there's some good examples from like the 40s or 50s from from um, Europe, um, and more recently, sort of more famously, I, I guess at least for maybe American archaeology, people have done it in the Maya region, trying to identify uh, market areas um, at at these Maya cities, right? And there there are it, it's phosphorus is a marker of organic content essentially in in the soil, and so part of the issue then becomes, you know, how can you separate it out? And so that's why if you think back to the inverted triangle, right, it's an argument, at least my argument rests in part on the sort of, uh, I don't think it might be a legal term, it might be like a law and order fake legal term, but like the preponderance of the evidence, you know, sort of trying to build a case through a series of overlapping criteria that help um, to distinguish uh, potential corral sites from other areas, say middens, that could be um, also high phosphorus areas, but you would potentially expect that middens would, or I would expect that middens would have uh, less uh, or, or fewer of these fecal spherulites. Uh, plus they're also often, at these Navajo sites at least, they're, they're pretty clear on the surface. They're, they're ashy kind of sheet middens. And because there's very little sort of stratigraphic buildup you can see them on the ground. So you can start to d differentiate between suspect features, structures, midden features. And then, you know, if this is high and this is high, well, there are other associated criteria that help you to separate out those factors. Um, that said, it's worth mentioning, um, and, you know, I kind of flew through it, right? But I didn't just select out those samples that I thought were uh potential corrals actually i chose other ones as well that were sort of served as controls and so um it's worth i at least in my mind you know one of the interesting things was that none of the other samples re returned any numbers ferrolites um whereas the ones that did have the high uh, phosphorus values and that were associated with these sort of potentially misidentified structures or corral type structures corral type features uh, did have them. So I think, um, yes, you, you can have human input, um, but you rely on the other contextual information at the archaeological site to help distinguish between them. Um, Fran, I see, I see some of the questions here. I see Matt Peoples' question, right? Do you think the kind of soil and sphere light sampling I've been doing could be incorporated into CRM survey projects at a larger scale for future IDs, given the associated cost and sampling time? Yes, I would actually love to see this um, rolled out on a larger scale, but I think there are some tweaks. Um, I want to keep running with this. You know, uh, I think I want to have a larger conversation at the, as you know, sort of the muddled, well, as I said, musings and takeaways. Uh, the musing part is like, well, I want to look at this, these, these relationships among early Navajo communities, um, but I need a larger sample size. So how can I go about doing this in a way that is cost effective, time effective? And so uh, one of the sort of key steps I'm taking moving forward is to try to explore other methods. I think in the grand scheme of things, you could probably tighten up the, 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 the number of soil samples. You can potentially take sort of opportunistic targeted soil samples, um, but trying to, the, the biggest kind of expertise and time sink and cost sink is finding people to uh, conduct the the, the spherolite analysis. It just, you know, it's, you need to process them and it takes somebody with a microscope and some training. But if you have familiarity with other types of micro remains, it, it's capable of doing. But I think some of the, the, the lab chemistry stuff could potentially be swapped out and say, um, I want to explore using you know, PXRF techniques to try to make it a little more streamlined, a bit quicker, potentially keep the costs up front and then in-house rather than replicated each time for a different project. So I think there's a lot of potential. Um, 
let's see. There's another question from Tom Rochek here, right? Um, I'm talking about small corral sizes in these early Diné test sites, and he asked, "Do I have a sense of when early sheep populations took off?" Um, I think this relates back to the comment I had in response to Matt's question: is that um, need more data? Uh, you know, I looked at, you know, for the disc, I looked at a corner of, you know, one of these canyons. If it is you know, potentially much more prevalent. Um, we can start to see, I think, it, it, it's a question in terms of both, I guess, intensity and then also extent. Um, and I think both are really interesting questions. And so if you can identify more sites, then you can get a sense of when that takes off. And then when you can start to see more reliably large potential corral features um, or identify them, uh, then I think you can start to uh, uh, get a sense of when um, potential populations started to to grow, to reach that number that right in 1795 that the Spanish governor is saying that Navajo herds are innumerable. Um, that's a really fascinating kind of statement. Um, and the question is, you know, well, would you start to see increase to archaeological remains? That's an interesting question. I think even if you look at historical Navajo sites, that would be really interesting. Maybe use some of the Black Mesa information or, or things like that to, to, again, take a 20th century, early 20th century, turn of the 20th century kind of example to, to kind of reference against um, and, and go from there. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's something to think about. My, my, my suspicion is it's the, my personal suspicion is that it's essentially the second half of the, the um, 18th century is when you start to see these, these numbers spike. And it's also the time when you see Dineta, you know, the Pueblitos seemingly um, abandoned, depopulated, what have you, and then people moving um, to other parts of the Four Corners or joining other Navajo communities that are already in, in place um, in those areas. Um, uh, let's see. We have any other questions? So that was the Q and A uh, in the chat. Are there any there? Do, 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 do. Don't see any others. Um, just I think you just talked a little bit more about the the key motivators of families moving out of their traditional areas. Um, Marilyn asks um, if there's any more about that that were that other motivators that that were happening at that time. Hmm. Okay. Well. Um, cool. Well. Is that it? I, okay. Uh, I guess so, unless, unless you have any. Uh... I don't see any other questions here. Um, yep, I don't see any others. Well, thank you so much, Wade. I, I know it's what, let's see, probably uh, 11 o'clock your time or something. It's 11 <laughs> so uh, we really, really, really appreciate you taking the time with us this evening. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very um, much. Yeah. Thank you all. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to to chat with you all and uh, I always enjoy um, making the uh, making the um, Arizona Arc and His talks whenever I'm in town. And it's always fun to see some of my relatives who have uh, who have um, chimed in. Um, if there are any Navajo folks who want to talk more about this or have any ideas, um, especially Navajo folks, if anybody wants to talk to me about this, I'm more than happy to talk about it. You can please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email um, is attached to the information that was distributed here and you can Google me. Um, but also um, if there's any Navajo folks too, I'd be really curious to, to talk with you more about sort of, you know, um, case by case or family by family, different experiences, different histories. Um, you know, I'm very well aware that Black Mesa isn't Monument Valley, isn't the Chuscas, isn't the the wastelands of the San Juan Basin or, or Western Navajo. You know, there's very different histories, um, and very different sort of herding traditions that are in place um, in these different areas. And I think that's a, um, there's, there, there's a lot going on. And I think a, a lot of the, 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 the importance of Navajo pastoralism to Navajo families to, to the families of the 20th century is a testament to its importance and also to the creativity and and uh, 
and skill of, of Navajo people as, as herders. So. Thank cool. you, Wade. Yeah. And, and thank you everyone else out there. Um, we're glad you could join us tonight. Uh, as, as typical, you will receive a follow-up email uh, from Zoom that, that talks about uh, our next lecture and gives you a chance to uh, a number that you can ask other questions if you have them. And if you have certain questions for Wade, I'll forward those to him. So uh, thank you everyone and have a good evening. <laughs>